Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Olaf Hellebo, CEO uh, with Renuron, and uh, yeah, a pleasure to present our company to you. Our disclaimer in, in the UK seems to be longer in the US. We are a UK public company. Uh, market cap is about $200 million. Um, over half of that is actually cash, um, following our uh, fundraise uh, recently. Um, we have uh, differentiated allogeneic um, stem cell technology. Um, the indications we're going for are all important potential blockbusters. Uh, stroke disability, stroke disability meaning chronic phases of stroke rather than acute. Um, CLI. Uh, and also uh, retinitis pigmentosa, which is a big uh, orphan indication within ophthalmic space. Um, in terms of clinical stage, uh, RP, we are starting a phase one study by the end of this year, so we're just getting started. Uh, stroke disability, we have a phase two study ongoing. And for CLI, we are in phase one. Uh, we're also uh, working on exosomes, um, something you saw from Capricorn earlier today. Uh, we are in the preclinical stage on that, but I'll show you some data on that, which is very exciting. So, yeah, I mentioned we are well funded. Um, I'll let you see the, who the investors are, some might be familiar to you. Um, we completed um, uh, over $100 million fundraise uh, a couple of months ago, um, and that gives us the runway for the next three years to provide pivotal readout in at least two of our programs. Um, it gives us the opportunity to invest in proper controlled clinical trials, which is what is crucial uh, in order to get both our company and the entire field to move forward. Um, and as a company, we're also going to increase our focus on the US market in terms of clinical trials. Um, up to now, all our clinical trials have been done in Europe. So let's have a look at our platform. So we have two platforms. Um, the CTX cell line is an immortalized cell line. Uh, we use cryopreservation, um, so the shelf life is a lot better now than it was when we did our phase one study. Um, also from the CTX cell line, and this is a, a fetally derived neural cortex stem cell. Um, from the C when we produce these uh, out of the media, we harvest exosomes. Um, and I'll come back to what we use those for in a second. Uh, our second product are human retinal progenitor cells, also fetally derived. Uh, we've licensed that technology in from uh, Harvard, and I'll come back to uh, our clinical program on that. Here's our pipeline. Uh, Michael Hunt, who is probably in the room, our CFO. Uh, John Sinden, our uh, founder and CSO, they've been working very hard for a decade or more to get us to where we are today. And I think what we have here is a promising pipeline. Uh, CTX for stroke disability, we have completed phase one, we are doing phase two now. Uh, CTX for CLI, we're doing a phase one study, next step there is a phase two. Um, HRPC, the second product for retinitis pigmentosa, we will start our phase one, two study uh, this year. Uh, and exosomes, we are still doing preclinical research on exosomes. I'd like to mention maybe also that the retinitis pigmentosa program there is a, could be a very fast moving program. That's two clinical trials um, to complete the entire program. So that actually could be the fastest moving of all of these. So let's look at the retinal program because of that. Um, we're excited about it. Um, it is very, very interesting. What we're trying to do is to not only rescue existing photoreceptors in order to stop the loss of vision, uh, but also mature, um, help regrow lost photoreceptors so you actually can restore the vision that has been lost to so actually turn the light back on uh, for these RP patients. So it's a big ask, but if you're successful, uh, it will be very, very significant. Um, and luckily, we're working with very smart people. Um, we work with Skepens Eye Research Institute at Harvard, um, UCL um, at uh, Moorfields, London. Um, and we also had uh, good backing from a very big charity, the Foundation Fighting Blindness in the US. They've given us KOL support as well as funding for preclinical trials, so thank you. <coughs> Our first indication, and there could be more, is <coughs> retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, we have orphan uh, drug designation, and we also have fast track designation for that product. Um, it is orphan, but it's a big orphan, 275,000 patients in the US and Europe. Um, and, um, 
if we are successful, we can treat all of them. I mean, the potential is all of those 275,000 patients. And if you compare that to Spark Therapeutics, um, they're also treating these patients. They're treating uh, the 1 to 3% of RP patients who have the RPE65 gene deficiency. Uh, so their target market is 3,500 patients. So I'm happy to have our target market. I prefer to have their market cap. <laughs> we'll work on it. Uh, let's see the animal data. So on your left, you, you, you see the RCS rat looking at, um, looking at this grid. And the, the way to know if the rat has improved vision is that you look at the head movements. So um, if the head moves, you can see something. Um, first of all, do no harm. So the next set of data there is in non-dystrophic rats. Uh, we inject the cells so the rats have um, normal vision. We inject the cells and the vision stays normal. So that means our cells are safe. That's the first thing you do. And then the second study is then in dystrophic rats. These rats lose the vision over six months. Uh, and again, here you can see these are different dose levels. Uh, you can see that in the injected eye, um, they lose vision, um, and in the, um, sorry, in the uninjected eye, uh, they lose vision, and in the injected eye, we can <coughs> preserve about half the vision versus a normal rat. So very nice um, uh, preclinical evidence that something is going on here. Uh, so this is over 26 weeks, that study. Um, We've also done a pig study, so in mini pigs, uh, where we have injected the cells. And the, what we see there is the very good cell survival, 80% survival after 12 weeks. So there is engraftment. Um, and we also can see that we're able to do this surgery. Um, so let's have a look at the clinical program. Our IND was approved uh, earlier this year. So we're now working to get going with the clinical program. Uh, it's going to be a phase one, two study. The phase one portion is nine patients, three different dose levels, 250,000, half a million, and one million cells. Um, and at the highest safe dose, we will then continue into a phase two portion uh, in nine addition, uh, sorry, six additional patients for a total of 15. So primary endpoint obviously is safety, but we will look at efficacy as well. Uh, we will look at both eyes. Uh, so we inject one eye, uh, but we measure uh, both of the eyes. Uh, and here's a schematic of how the injection is done. Um, there are three ports uh, into the eye. Um, one, the, one infusion cannula is really just to relieve the pressure. There's a light guide so the surgeon can see what he does. And then the subretina cannula, um, the retina is detached temporarily, um, and the cells are then put into, um, into a bleb. Uh, in the retina and the cells will remain there and then they will uh, spread over the retina and they will stay where they should be. Um, so, uh, so that's how it works. It's very normal day surgery for an eye surgeon. Not something you would like me to do, I promise you. And moving on to stroke, which is our most advanced program. <coughs> stroke is obviously a very, very large indication. Uh, it's been a terrible indication for pharmaceutical development. Uh, many companies have tried, particularly in acute stroke, uh, and there's only one, um, there's only TPP uh, approved uh, and must be administered within a couple of hours. Uh, and after that, there is no pharma pharmacological interventions possible. Uh, we'd like to change that, but we're looking at the chronic stages. So these are patients who've survived the stroke and are left with some permanent disabilities. Uh, we're using the mechanism of action of a CTX cells in that they can grow new blood vessels uh, and that they can uh, uh, grow new neurons, uh, as well as there's an immune modulatory effect. Um, and we believe these mechanisms of action is what behind uh, the results that we've seen. Uh, and here are the phase one data. Uh, these are 24 month uh, data. Uh, we did a single arm phase one study in 11 patients. Um, the, the top dose was 20 million cells, and that's the dose we've taken into phase two. Um, there were no cell-related adverse events. Uh, there was encouraging results across the different efficacy measures that they use in stroke. There are quite a lot of different scales that are being used. Uh, the gold standard is the NIHSS, uh, and the patient dropped from seven points to five after three months after the single injection. Uh, and that efficacy has been maintained all the way over two years. Uh, we presented our two-year data in April, 
And it was right after the gene therapy data came out that two years was a bit shaky, so we were kind of happy that it looked good, at least in the small patient population that you see here. So based on that, we have started the phase two study. Uh, it is still a single arm study, so it's 21 patients. Controlling is a bit tricky when it comes to stroke, but I'll come to it in a second. Um, we took the 20 million cell uh, dose, and uh, we've added a couple of endpoints that are more about functional measures. What we're most interested in is to look at um, paresis. Some of these, a lot of stroke patients have one side of their body that's paretic, and really the goal here is to be able to, for a patient who has an arm that's really hanging completely dead, to be able to get mobility back. That will have a huge impact on that patient, but also pharmacoeconomically in terms of disability and dependency. Uh, we will have the data for that study first half next year, and then we will kick off a controlled phase three study uh, by the end of next year. And control here is sham surgery, so that means that you actually uh, you make a hole in the head of the placebo patient. Um, you don't actually penetrate all the way, so you don't uh, introduce any infection risk, but the patient is convinced that he or she had, had the th treatment. Um, and yeah, there is a precedence for doing that. Uh, it's definitely possible to do in the US, a bit more tricky in Europe actually, so we'll do that in the US. Second indication for CTX is critical limb ischemia. I uh, see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go a little bit quick through that. Uh, it's all about restoring uh, blood flow uh, to the lower limbs. Um, these patients have um, um, very poor blood flow. They end up with uh, gangrene that can lead to death, so they have to have amputation as basically uh, the treatment, which is obviously very medieval. Uh, this is a great place for allogeneic stem cell therapy. We are running a phase one study. It's a pure safety study. Uh, these patients aren't really sick enough for efficacy measures. Um, and then we will start a phase two study uh, by the middle of 2016. And I'm gonna skip over the rest there and go to exosomes. <coughs> you heard from Linda Marban earlier today from Capricor, uh, a little bit about exosomes and what they're doing. Um, and uh, we also think this is a very interesting area. Uh, exosomes are all about cell-to-cell -cell signaling, um, and there is no doubt that there is a therapeutic potential here um, and that we're digging into. In terms of mechanism action, what we're seeing is that there are some microRNAs, and actually, in our case, four very specific ones that seem to endanger the effect that we're seeing. And this is very, very early stuff, but I'll show it to you anyway. Um, we were doing work in wound healing and we saw fibroblast migration, and we got to be worried that maybe they would have a negative effect in cancer, meaning that cancer would grow. So we did some cancer studies to make sure there was no issue here, and actually what we saw was the opposite. Uh, we saw this, uh, these cancers actually just blow up. Um, so on, on your left you see some pictures. Um, these are cancers in a dish, glioblastoma cancer in a dish. Um, they're untreated control, it just keeps growing. Um, Active control PI3 kinase inhibitor has a reduction uh, in the growth, and the exosomes treated, it seemed to have no effect in the beginning, but after about 14 days, uh, the cancer just disappeared in the dish, uh, just cell debris left, so we thought, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, we did that five times, we got the same result every time. Uh, so then we went into a mouse study. Uh, so here we have a mouse where we have um, the, the cancer uh, put into the flank of the animal, uh, and very much the same results. Day 12, we injected into the tumor uh, the exosomes, and it grew for a while, and then after about three weeks, um, it reduced significantly in volume. So this is something very, very interesting for us to go into further. It's very, very early, so let's not get too excited, but I am anyway. And I'll leave you with the last slide. These are our clinical milestones. Uh, for the next uh, few years. Um, this is all funded, so this is kind of, it's up to us. Um, we have potentially two products that we can file uh, by the end of this uh, period. Uh, we have the resources to do it, so it's basically up to us to deliver. So uh, we have some work to do. Uh, thank you very much for staying in a dark conference room rather than in the California sunshine.